guys always win. How about that? One sad but undeniable fact of life is that you won't always succeed with everything you do. It's especially frustrating when you fail, despite trying your absolute hardest. This is a lesson painfully learned by many characters in video games. It's one thing to lose as a player, it's a whole nother thing to see the hero fail. The same hero you spent so long playing as. The fact that it's so rare to see this happen in gaming makes it all the more shocking when it does. There are many factors for how high a character ranks here. How big was the tragedy of their failure? How close were they to achieving their goal? There are also disqualifiers, characters that weren't heroic to begin with, and characters whose failures were poorly executed. With all this in mind, let us begin. This is the top 10 heroes fails. I mean, failed heroes. Sorry, uh, hard to let go of the old miniseries called Turkey. The old chosen one status. You're handpicked to be the protector or savior of some land, and it doesn't matter how young or old you are, the needs of the many outweigh your needs. You could understand the risks and have the bravery to accept and fulfill your destiny, but it doesn't come without a price. You can end up like Steven Universe, where you face emotional and physical traumas that'll affect you later in life, or you can end up like the four champions of Hyrule and not make it back alive. Oh, it has to be me. Yes, me. It has to be me. Poor me. It couldn't be him. It couldn't be you. It has to be me. As the name suggests, the champions are a team of warriors chosen to protect Hyrule from Calamity Ganon. Of course, you got Zelda as the leader and Link as our marketing figure, but new to the table is Rivali, a cocky little Rito, Daruk, an eager, big, strong Goron who's hilariously afraid of dogs, Urbosa, the awesome Gerudo, and Mifa, the adorable little Zora and Link's childhood friend, and it's still not fair! She was gonna propose and she had a log like the moment she was going to tell you! Sorry, I needed a moment. Anyways, each of the four champions was chosen to pilot the Divine Beast, basically the Megazords of the Zelda franchise, to face Calamity Ganon head-on. Unfortunately, it didn't work. The Blight Ganons each killed the four champions, and Ganon himself took control of the Divine Beasts, using their powers to throw all of Hyrule into chaos, while the spirits of our fallen heroes could only sit back and watch, knowing that they couldn't keep their promise to Zelda. Yeah, the reason that the champions are at the bottom is that it's kind of a simple tale of the long-ago heroes that tried and failed. But it doesn't make it any less tragic. These are genuinely good people whose lives were cut short trying to defend their kingdom. In Mifa's case, really short because she hadn't gotten a chance to live even half of what should have been a very long life. Thankfully, our boy Link is around to avenge his fallen friends by smiting the Blight Ganons for them, and in exchange, they each give him a special ability to help him further on his quest. And in the end, when he finally smites Calamity Ganon, the champion's spirits can finally rest, knowing that Link helped them with their unfinished business. If that ain't poetic, I don't know what is. Final Fantasy, the franchise that has a million entries in its series despite the name. Anywho, with how many games in the series, it's not surprising that at least one or two heroes failed on their journey to the top. The most obvious one would be the heroes of Final Fantasy VI who couldn't stop Kepka from destroying the world. But I want to go grander. Not in terms of scale of the consequences, but in terms of spectacle. And luckily, there is no game grander in scale than the critically acclaimed MMORPG that has a free trial up to level 60 with unlimited playtime and includes the award-winning first expansion Heavensward, Final Fantasy XIV. I swear I'm not a shill. I talked about XIV before in regards to the spectacle that ends the game 1.0 version. Long story short, the game was so bad that the game's director changed and the new director told the development staff to... Burn it. Bad boss. Burn it. Burn it! And then restart from the ashes. And the crazy thing is, they tied that internal development into the story. To summarize as best I can, your player character or warrior of light slash adventurer has been trying to stop the Garlean Empire from bringing the Red Moon Dalamut to the country of Eorzea. One of the generals of the Empire, Nail Von Darnus, was using the evasion of Eorzea as a way to summon Dalamut and infuse himself with its powers. Darnus was defeated by the adventurer, but that doesn't stop Dalamut from descending. Turns out Darnus survived and attacked the city-states of Eorzea directly, forcing both sides to engage in a bloody war in the fields of Cartano. Oh, this is gonna end well. Unfortunately, Darnus eventually wins, and Dalamut's true power is unleashed in the form of the primal Bahamut. Bahamut's sheer power rains down onto Eorzea while the adventurer could do nothing to stop it. 
They are saved by the sage Louisa, who attempts to put up a shield to protect them, but it fails. He then tries to imprison Bahamut in a barrier by summoning the power of the gods, known as the Twelve. But even that fails. With his final ounce of strength, Louisa sends the adventurer into the space-time rift, hoping for them to fight again when they are able to in the future. And just, just watch this cutscene, Flames of Truth. It's absolutely insane. The utter spectacle of this moment as you're witnessing an event that you cannot stop and are forced to flee as the world around you is destroyed. For five years, the Warrior of Light is missing and the world must rebuild after what is eventually called the Seventh Umbral Calamity. So if the Warrior did fail, why is this so low? Well, the Warrior didn't die. They were transported five years into the future where they canonically became so strong, even the world's strongest fighters can't beat them. As for Louisa and Bahamut, in the Binding Coil of Bahamut raid, it was revealed that Louisa was able to kill Bahamut by becoming the Primal Phoenix, not only saving the world, but also using the last of his magic to rejuvenate it, making the damage not as bad as it could have been. Seems a bit of a cop-out, yeah, but hey, your player character does eventually get the revenge of Bahamut. The entire raid is focused on finding the remains of Bahamut and killing his inner soul to prevent him from resurrecting. So in an incredibly convoluted, only possible in Final Fantasy way, your character did succeed. Despite the revelations shown in the Bahamut raid, it doesn't completely deter from the sense of dread and impact that the end of 1.0 had for the Final Fantasy XIV story. The sense of an impending doom in the form of a red moon bearing down on you, seeing all of your fellow players group up and await the end and from the ashes, one of the greatest MMOs and stories in gaming arises? It's a feeling like no other. Once upon a time, in a land of... Wherever Dragongar takes place, the world was saved thanks to the efforts of five goddesses known as the Intoners. But then, everything changed when the six Intoners Zero attacked. She proclaimed that she would kill her sisters and bring the world's peace to an end. Throughout most of Dragongar 3, Zero's goal is nothing more than sheer bloodshed. Or so it seems. In Branch D, you finally learn the full context of everything and the story completely changes. As it turns out, Zero and her sisters aren't goddesses at all. They're entities created by a being simply known as the Flower. If left to their own devices, the Intoners will be corrupted by the power of their song and bring the world to an end. The only way to prevent this is for all the Intoners, including Zero, to die. So why didn't she just simply tell the others? Well, all the Intoners were given false memories by the Flower that they really were sisters and goddesses. Zero is the only one who was able to break free. Zero and one. In contrast to her fellow Intoners, one is proper and virtuous. In fact, she was the one who led the others to liberate the land. In a more traditional story, she would have been our protagonist. Due to her intelligence, one was able to figure out that she was also given false memories by the flower. But whereas Zero is willing to slaughter through everything in her way, one tried to be more diplomatic. Specifically, she tried to believe that she was above the influence of the flower and could rule by herself. And yet, she ends up dying in every route. One's existence really sucks when you get down to it. She's created as nothing more than a harbinger of destruction, yet managed to save the world. Unfortunately for her, the nature of her existence meant that her victory would never last. Zero succeeded because she viewed herself as being just as expendable as everyone else. Her ruthless pragmatism ultimately proved justified. Of course, one does lose a few points because she's only playable through the DLC. Still, her whole story is a grim reminder that what's morally correct may not necessarily be the best decision. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. All right, now that we got through all that Dragon Guard lore, let's get through something a little less complicated. Ace Attorney lore. Honestly, that isn't much of an understatement. Ace Attorney lore isn't too hard to understand. They just make up a new backstory for each character every game. Ayo! This particular hero is a bit unique compared to the others, mostly because she actually gets most of her screen time after she dies. Yep, we're talking about everyone's favorite mentor lawyer from beyond the grave, Mia Fey. So Mia's a bit of an odd choice since she's a constant helper to Phoenix throughout the original trilogy, popping up with advice through her sister Maya and cousin Pearl. But looking at her backstory and what ultimately led to her untimely end speaks to her mission throughout the first game. Mia's mother, Misty, was a spirit medium tasked to channel the dead to help solve a difficult murder eventually called the DL6 incident. 
While the spirit she channeled pointed to a suspect, the suspect was eventually found innocent in a court of law. This act caused the Korean channeling technique that the Fae Clan uses to come under scrutiny, and Misty herself was labeled a fraud, forcing to withdraw from public eye, leaving her daughters behind. Mia eventually grew up and became a lawyer with major goals being to find the truth behind the DL6 incident, find and blow the whistle on the people who labeled her mother a fraud, and restore her mother and family's reputation. This led to her finding dirt on Red White, the man who leaked the story about her mother to the press, causing her public image to deteriorate. Unfortunately, White was more dangerous than she expected, leading to her murder by White's own hand. White then blamed her murder on Maya and gallantly pranced away with no way to prove his guilt. Well, Mia left two people behind who could take up her mission in her sister Maya and our favorite spiky-haired blue-clothed lawyer, Sonic the- oh, oh wait, I mean Phoenix Wright. Anyways, Phoenix and Maya were able to convict White with Mia's help, and Phoenix went on to find out the truth behind DL6, restoring the Fae Clan's reputation, and even kept fighting for it by defending Maya in every game she's in. Even the Professor Layton crossover which boggles my mind so much. Mia is an interesting choice because she does help directly through Maya, but her death still caused her to fail and allow Phoenix to succeed for her in the future. Even when she failed as a lawyer in the third game, she still rose above it and succeeded to become one of the best attorneys in the series. Now we're off to the hunt. 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 I've made jokes over and over about how Wander, our player character from Shadow of the Colossus, is essentially a hunter going around, intruding on the Colossi's turf, and basically murdering a pack of oversized wild animals. Okay, yeah, that's basically what happens, but there's a legitimate reason he's doing all this. From the start, Wander only cared about reviving Mono, his girlfriend, sister, childhood friend, whatever. She must have been someone pretty dang important if he wanted to bring her back. Anyway, in comes sneaky old Mr. Dorman, the demonic overarching baddie, to offer Wander a deal. If the young hero can slay the 16 Colossi, they can bring Mono back. What Wander doesn't know is that it'll also give Dorman a free pass to use him as a vessel to escape its seal once again. In the end, he does get his wish and Mono is revived, but Wander is turned into a baby. So he did succeed, but at what cost? The price of freedom, Master Mac. It's definitely fair to write Wander off as some doofus hunter who screwed the pooch, but here's the thing. If he did know Dorman's real game, I'm not sure he would have cared. Dorman did give him a warning that going on this quest would come with a heavy price, but Wander didn't care about the risk. All he cared about was saving someone he cared about. Heck, he went through all that effort finding all the Colossi and slaying them all for the sake of a loved one. Does that make killing the Colossi right? No. Did he mess up? Oh, big time. But he had good intentions, willing to put himself on the line for Mono. The things we do for love, I think? I neither confirm nor deny that I would do something similar with Ari. Aw, that's sweet, honey. But you're assuming that I'd be done in before you. What? You know, for all the praise Danganronpa gets for its characters and twisty stories, the protagonists always feel... samey. I mean, they all have defining traits that set them apart, sure, but the general archetype is down to the same thing. Socially awkward guys who are terrified of the killing game, doing what they can to survive while playing spectator to the antics of their classmates. You'd think a series this meta would catch on to that and try to subvert it already. Come on, can we get just one protagonist, one, that is just sick of all the killing game crap and just wants it all to be over as soon as possible? Okay, you beat me that time. V3 is very mix and match when it comes to its writing. Some people enjoy the direction the story takes, while others can't get past the lackluster subplots and poor character dynamics. That said, one aspect the community can generally agree on is how good the first chapter is. And it's thanks to the star of the episode, Kaede Akamatsu. Kaede starts off with a well-mannered attitude that you'd typically expect from the protagonist. But unlike the other DR leads, she's not passive or awkward. She's very assertive and is not afraid to retaliate to her classmates when they smack talk her or drop a few snarky remarks where it counts. She even picks up on their shortcomings and offers suggestions to help them better themselves. She may be demanding and forces blind optimism on her without thinking about the long game, but hey, she's not perfect. She wanted to save all her friends and end the killing game so that no one had to kill each other. Sadly, that's hardly a plausible goal, especially when she's just another one of many participants with little power over the game. The only way she can achieve a goal that far-fetched is by letting go of her friendly attachments and taking matters into her own hands. 
And so she did. Based on the clues Shuichi provided for her, Kaede devised a plan to snuff out the mastermind and end the killing game as soon as possible, but to no avail. She ends up murdering the wrong person and is put in a position where the only way she can save her friends is by letting them indict her during the class trial and let herself be executed. On the surface, this just seems like one of the series' daring ways to show that they don't play nice and will kill anyone if it dares to even if it's a protagonist. But what makes Kaida's arc work is that it's not just about the shock value of a decoy protagonist. Heck, that's not even new to gaming in general. What made it work was how well it conveys her humanity. Despite how much she truly cares for her friends, she doesn't hold back on making the sacrifice necessary to end the killing game as soon as possible. Unfortunately, the mastermind is in too much control to simply fall for her plans as she succumbs to the temptation the killing game is built on. Even when Shuichi takes her mantle as the main lead, he can only play it safe and fight the mastermind when the situation is convenient. Even he can't save everyone. He can only do his best to survive. Then again, I wouldn't put it past Kotaka to kill a mastermind as early as the game starts either. With all the possible ways you could lose allies in Fire Emblem, the Lords are always meant to be kept alive at all times to carry on with the story. You don't see the protagonist dying becoming a norm until Three Houses made us adapt to seeing our heroes meet their maker. But would you believe when I say killing a Fire Emblem Lord went even further back than that? Well, Fire Emblem 4 beat them all to the punch with its own brand of protagonist, Sigurd of Chalfi. Sigurd is a royal knight in service of Granvale. He's got the noble stance we'd expect from a Fire Emblem Lord, but he sticks out by being a really sociable and supportive fella, who can be a bit of a jolly troublemaker in his own right. On top of that, he had a loving family, buddies from across the land, and even found true love. As abrupt as it may be. And you are? Deirdre. Deirdre! We shall be married in the morning! It helps that, unlike most lords back then, Sigurd is a monster on the battlefield, mowing down just about any enemy unit and barely taking any damage in return, remaining the best unit in the game for a while. Sure is a fine way to get us attached to the triangle chin mad lad, huh? As time went on, Sigurd succumbed to the tragedies resulting from the conspiracy across Jugrul. This led to him making enemies with his friends, being framed for conspiracy in his own homeland, and being exiled for years since then. To make matters worse, his wife was kidnapped by Manfroy, his sister and brother-in-law were ambushed and killed, and his father was executed by the conspirators. Everything that could have gone wrong for Sigurd went about as south as it could get. Murphy's Law is an unforgiving law. Naturally, when he returns to his homeland to quell the conspiracy, he'd be ecstatic to find out that the royal guards, led by Arvis, believed in his innocence and are willing to welcome him back. Only for it all to be one big trap made to execute him and his comrades. To add even more salt to the open wound, it's revealed that Arvis was betrothed to Sigurd's missing wife, who didn't even remember Sigurd due to the man for his brainwashing. Right as he faces the biggest heartbreak of his life, Arvis executed him, removing one of Grand Vale's most commendable platoons in a single meteor shower. Way to go, Arvis! That certainly won't bite you in the butt in the future. <gasps> Oopsie! Sigurd's execution was a huge deal back then. It's a real eye-opener for a lot of people to what sorts of things can happen in video game storytelling, and how much impact they can leave when the main character lacks plot armor. The sad thing is, there wasn't much Sigurd could really do. He's just a knight doing his job and has to depend on his superiors to make the big decisions. And when there's no one left to give him orders, he's forced to deal with what comes next until the fire goes out. Sure, he could have foreseen Arvis's trap ahead of time, but given the crap he's been dealing with, can you really blame him for jumping at the first sign of good news? It's not until 17 years later when his son Selif takes after his father and liberates the land from the Lopterian invasion for good. While he did succeed in saving his father's tainted legacy, the fact still stands that Sigurd never got to live the life he wanted. So much was taken away from him, and all the effort he put into saving his homeland was revoked and given credit to an enemy. Saving his son and escorting him to a different kingdom is pretty much the only action he took that ended up paying off in the long run. Sigurd may have started off as a fairly standard main lead, but the realism surrounding what he went through is what really makes him worth appreciating. Sometimes, you never know how much you'd care for how good a person the hero is until you see how miserable they had it. Tragedy is a part of life. To live is to suffer tragedy. These tragedies can be both great and small. They may be averted here and there, but eventually, it all ends the same. In death. And yet, we've still found the will to carry on. 
We do not succumb to the despair that hardship and death bring as their constant companion. We find reasons to live. Well, yeah, and I'm sad. But at the same time, I'm really happy that something can make me feel that sad. It's like, it, it, it makes me feel alive, you know? Lucas was forced to face the great tragedy of his mother's death and his older twin brother's disappearance as a young boy. At first, he was consumed by grief, and many in his situation would be. However, as the years rolled by, Lucas took his tragedy and used it as fuel to improve himself. Lucas came to be more and more gallant. He uses his strength to help those who can't help themselves. He's even referred to as a truly good lad. Indeed, he is one who embodies the phrase, the hottest fires forge the strongest steel. Unfortunately, this is a list of failed heroes. Most of you know how this story ends. Lucas is forced to strike down the masked man, who was his brother Klaus the whole time, and pulls out the final needle keeping the dark dragon asleep. It awakes, and the results are cataclysmic. What happens after that is, um, up for debate. Some think the world was simply remade, and thus healed at the evil the pig masks wrought upon it. Others think that the final scene after the end credits is of the afterlife. Everyone is dead, they just don't realize it yet. Whatever the case, Lucas technically fails because the world isn't saved, either by way of a new world replacing the old one, or by way of everyone being dead. Boy, his life sucks. No. Thank you. Hello, Loki. I have words! Once again, I got to relive the crime that was committed against probably one of the most beautiful VR games and what could have been a love letter to Norse mythology, Asgard's Wrath. In this epic tale, you are the fledgling god of animals, gifted with the ability to possess mortal heroes and create followers out of miscellaneous animal parts. You're guided by the infamous god of mischief, Loki, on a series of quests to help the mortal heroes. These can include helping an angry shield maiden avenge her brother, or helping a blind priest stop an invasion, and all the while collecting stones to give to Loki for... Pff, who knows what, probably nothing important. And, if I may say so, you make a pretty awesome god! You saved all these people, helped so many others, and brought peace throughout the land! Heck, you create life with the followers and actually have the option to bond with them and give them fist bumps! And that blind priest I mentioned? You actually gave him his sight back when you possessed him! Okay, that might not actually count, but still! You're a benevolent god that truly cares about those around him, especially the mortals. And what's your reward for doing all these nice things? You find out you were duped by Loki and the whole thing was a sham. Yep, all those good deeds you performed and all the people you've helped slash grown attached to, none of it was real. Instead, Loki gets a way to do what Lokis do best and locks you away in a bittersweet illusion. So essentially, all the good you did was for nothing. You lost, Loki won! Okay, mythology rules are rules, and Loki was always going to be a little shit in the end. But why go through so much effort of building a heroic character just to yank the rug from under him? I've said it before, and I'll keep saying it. Up until the ending, Asgard's Wrath was a perfectly fine game. A masterpiece, even. But gotta work in that twist ending somehow if you want to keep Loki's mischievous streak alive. Guess it's true what they say. It's up to be a god. I have no mouth and I must scream. Quite possibly the bleakest story ever told. What it lacks in length, it more than makes up in sheer cruelty. It tells the story of five humans trapped by a sadistic supercomputer known as Am. Am, having become self-aware, uses his vast resources to horrifically torture our heroes. And this torture has lasted for over a century. So naturally, this is the perfect kind of story to adapt to a point-and-click adventure game. I mean, look at the others in the genre. I'm sure Sam and Max players would eat this up. The PC game adaptation of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream greatly expands upon the original. Each of the five humans has their own scenarios to play through, exploring their backstories. As we learn, each of them had far from ideal lives even prior to the torture. Ellen was a victim of assault. Gorister's wife went insane. Nimdok was a Nazi scientist, Ted was a con artist, and Benny was a military commander that killed his own men. 
The best decisions in these scenarios require you to make self-sacrifices and let the characters come to terms with their pasts. So yes, the game does have various endings, with nearly all of them being variations of the original story's horrific ending. Interestingly enough, Harlan Ellison, the story's original author, wanted the game to be unwinnable. Of course, his co-writer disagreed with that, and there is a good ending. Heavy emphasis on the quotes. Assuming you got absolutely everything correct, the five humans are able to defeat Am. Unfortunately, it comes at a heavy cost. All but one of them die for good, and your chosen survivor must undergo the process of reforming the Earth. Even then, Am's consciousnesses vow they'll inevitably return. I mean, the original story was bleak enough, but you know it's sad when the best ending that these characters could actually get is finally being put out of their misery. But in a really cosmic sort of way, this ending is actually kind of uplifting. Permit me to elaborate. As I mentioned before, the five humans all went through miserable lives prior to Am's torture. In Nimdok and Benny's cases, they had long since crossed the line. Yet, despite all of this, they ultimately took the moral high ground in the end. Any sane person would have given up, but they kept going even when it seemed hopeless. I have no mouth and I must scream, while showing the most nihilistic scenario imaginable, ultimately gives the most encouraging message possible. Even when everything seems hopeless, there's always a way. Just don't be surprised if it takes the better part of 109 years to get there. I'm Josh Scorcher, and... Okay, I gotta be honest here, guys. It says here in the script that I'm supposed to do Danganronpa style, uh, don't lose hope now. And then we go into the Kaboom. I have no idea what that's referring to. I mean, I, I've seen a little bit of the playthroughs of Danganronpa, but I actually haven't played Danganronpa, and I'm really relying on the opinions of people who have played it. I mean, it's not that I think it's a bad game, it's just uh, not really a game that I'm interested in. I mean, it seems like a great game, it's just I never really felt the need to try it. Please don't not subscribe. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.